Good morning. Um, <clears throat> call to order public meeting 256. As, as a note, uh, we are not um, able to have closed captioning today, but the meeting is being streamed. Uh, first call is the approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure, Madam Chair, thank you. The uh, minutes from the November 8th, 2018 meeting are in your packet, and I move the uh, commission approve those minutes subject to correction for any typographical errors or other non-material matters. Further discussion? I do have a uh, um, point that I'd like to make, maybe um, a small correction, but um, uh, at the time of 11:12, at the end of that um, section, uh, which is which begins really in in, in page four, uh, there is a mention that um, that I was not in favor of the application in light of the pending plans for demolition. Um, and I, I'd just like to mention that my opposition was in light of the fact that I did not believe it maximizes, that the application did not maximize the benefits to the Commonwealth, uh, which is one of the criteria for uh, approving the application. We can make that change. Did you want to strip out the plans for demolition language? No, no, I think, uh, I think that's, that's one factor, but the bigger, the bigger theme was that uh, my feeling was that it just didn't maximize uh, the benefits. So if we added that. Yep. Everything else is, I think, appropriately summarized. Okay. All in favor with those additions? Aye. 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 Uh, four zero. To approve the minutes. Next, we have our administrative update. Uh, Executive Director Bedrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As we. Uh, near the end of the year, I want to update you on sort of staff's everyday activities. Our gaming agents, game enforcement unit licensing folks continue to regulate Plain Ridge Park Casino and MGM Springfield. Um, I want to thank our horse racing staff. Um, as you know, we have a large seasonal staff and they just literally ended their harness season last week. So thank them for a, um, another successful season. Um, also, staff is helping me prepare for the, what I think I call the 90-day reports from MGM Springfield concerning um, so-called crosswalk designation, the MGM Springfield floor, and the Plaza Beverage License. I anticipate presenting these matters to the commission at the next tentatively scheduled meeting, which would be December 20th and would be out in Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, I also hope to report on the MGM Springfield opening, oh, I'm sorry, opening process at that meeting. Um, on item seven, uh, the Community Mitigation Fund application guidelines, I just want to tell you Joe Delaney will be substituting for John Ziembo, cannot be here today. Uh, finally, on uh, the wind suitability review, you will see item nine, an executive session during which you will be briefed by our general counsel and outside lawyers on the implications of recently filed legislation in Nevada on a process for getting to an adjudicatory hearing. Um, I can say that I think absent this litigation, I would have anticipated that the commission would have been in the adjudicatory process at this point. Um, so, uh, I mean, you'll learn more about the litigation, obviously, in the executive session. and. Um, interim Chair Cameron, I know I'd, I'd told you this information um, um, before, and you had expressed to me some thoughts about it, too. Yes. You complete with your um, I update? Am. Well, I, I, am. I, I had a statement to make regarding this matter, too. I am. Thank on you. On behalf of the Commission. Um, you know, I'd like to acknowledge that the Commission and its staff are facing a complex set of circumstances and must balance consideration for due process the investigatory uh, requirements, related litigation, and the overall integrity of the process. I'm also well aware of the intense and ceaseless effort that uh, has been undertaken by MG, uh, MGC staff, IEB in particular, since January. I want to thank you for your continued hard work, perseverance, and dedication. 
Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity as the interim chair to reiterate the Commission's role as an adjudicatory body and repeat the standards by which we are legally bound to preserve the integrity of the process and ensure the impartiality of the Commission's decision making. The gaming law is explicit in its mandate that the investigations and enforcement bureau must be allowed to investigate matters without commission influence. The law further stipulates that the commission shall not place any restrictions upon the IEB's ability to investigate violations under the Gaming Act and pertaining to any of our regulations. When the IEB investigates a matter that could impact the rights of a gaming licensee, such as the win suitability review, the Commission is required to hold an adjudicatory process, Chapter 30A, which outlines the conduct of the adjudicatory proceedings by Commonwealth agencies, requires that a party impacted by an agency decision have the opportunity to a full and fair hearing. As a reminder, under 23K, the gaming law, in matters affecting a gaming licensee, the Commission the commissioners sit as the administrative judges to hear the matter. Both IEB and the licensee will hopefully soon present evidence orally or in writing and the commissioners will then have unrestricted opportunity to ask questions of both the IEB and the licensee. Uh, since the commissioners, the four of us, sit as the judges in this adjudicatory proceeding, we must make our decisions impartially based solely upon the evidence before us. We must not in any way um, have access to investigations materials prior to the adjudicatory process. And um, so that the reason we do this, so there is an appearance, there is no appearance of prejudgment of this matter. As further reminder, the law requires that the separation between the investigators and the judges, us in this case, clearly, that is clearly mandated in the gaming law. Having said all that, we are uh, profoundly mindful of the public interest in this matter and fully appreciate the scrutiny of our process. Since the launch of this investigation, I believe we have consistently done our best to transparently provide status updates and our most thoughtful estimates about timing, which is a challenge given the nature of an investigation. That being said, I'm keenly aware of our shared frustrations over the de desire to finalize this matter, which is now further complicated by litigation in Nevada. My fellow commissioners and I are ready to adjudicate this matter and eager to assess the findings. Uh, identifying a viable way to bring the investigation to a close is an urgent priority. The next step toward advancing this process is for the outside counsel, our outside counsel, to thoroughly brief the commissioners about litigation strategy during an executive session, and that will happen later today. Any other questions? Um, you know, thank, thank you for those. Uh, well, I was going to ask something that you addressed at the end, and, um, and let me simply tell me that uh, it might be addressed later, if that's the case, but um, you mentioned um, if it weren't for this late litigation um, filed in Nevada, we would be in a position to have been conducting by now an adjudicatory proceeding like we estimated. Um, so it's fair to say that the investigation and report are substantially uh, complete. Is that, is that a fair statement? So uh, I don't want to lock the process into a particular time frame and sort of saying nothing can happen after that process, and certainly it can. Um, but I would have anticipated, yeah, absent this litigation, that we'd be in that adjudicatory process, which doesn't mean that, you know, if someone looks at whatever comes out down the road, there not, might not be something that happened from, you know, this date forward, um, because we're at this point. Um, but, yeah, we would have been in an adjudicatory process. And it's also fair to say that we don't know the time frame uh, that this could take based on a number of things that could happen um, relative to that litigation. We cannot forecast um, when, uh, when we might be looking at, at a, an adjudicatory process at this point. Uh, I can't, but I think you'll learn more about the, the legal process and, and the strategy in the executive session. Okay. Well, I look forward to that update. I think we all do. Thank you.
Okay, uh, moving on, uh, response, uh, research and responsible gaming, Director Vanderlinden. It, it, uh, let me, uh, I'm sorry to jump back to one subject matter. Let me, let me just say this and sort of emphasize this um, and, and to feed off what the interim chair Cameron said. Um, and I try to emphasize this. When, believe me, staff wants this done. Um, we, we, there are a lot of folks who have worked really, really hard. Um, and I know there are a lot of really important stakeholders here, um, but staff really wants mm -hmm. this done also. So if there is a way to get it done which complies with the law and all our responsibilities, staff wants this done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm joined uh, today by Dr. Rachel Volberg, Dr. Rob Matanif, Matamidi, oh, and um, newly Dr. Um, Melissa Mazar. Congratulations. Congrats. Within the last uh, couple of weeks, so congratulations. Congrats. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so in 2013, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission selected a team from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to lead a key component of an extensive research agenda that was mandated by Section 71 of the 2011 Expanded Gaming Act. Um, this is widely accepted as a first of its kind study called SIGMA, or the Social and Economic Impacts of Gaming in Massachusetts, and it's being carried out by a multidisciplinary team of internationally recognized experts in their respective areas. Over the past five years, they've collected ex extensive baseline and follow-up data on the social and economic changes in Massachusetts related to the introduction of casino gambling. A summary of impacts has been, that have been observed um, as of July of 2018 is captured in a report that will be presented to you today and released to our website immediately after. This is the first in a series of reports that will analyze changes in Massachusetts' social and economic landscape after the introduction of new gambling venues. Um, a, couple, a couple key points, um, we're largely looking at changes as a result of the opening and operation of Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, and what we're really looking at, um, not only at, at what is captured in this report, but also understand this as, as a framework of where we are going in the future as we begin to, to explore what are the impacts of other casinos that open in Massachusetts. Um, following the, the presentation of this report, we're excited to um, share with you 10 fact sheets, which are one-page briefings that summarize the findings of the social and economic impacts of gambling in Massachusetts. And these are, these are I think, um, great because they're, they're really for, for anybody to read um, and um, can be easily digested with a variety of different types of stakeholders. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Good morning Rachel. It's always nice to be back in Boston, although <laughs> I must say the traffic this morning was quite a challenge. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's always good to be back. Okay. Um, so you may have uh, already noticed that instead of Mark Melnick, uh, we have another great member of our uh, Donahue team with us, Rod, uh, is, um, I, I forget your title, Rod. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so it's fine. Uh, I'm a research manager uh, at the Economic and Public Policy Research Unit at Donahue Institute. Mark is our director and is in Chelmsford unexpectedly, so I am here filling in. Okay. So, and, and you've, you've met Rod before, and Rod before, and he's presented, so um, I'm just going to plunge right in. Uh, so seven years ago, um, Governor Deval Patrick signed the Expanded Gaming Act, as you all know, permitting casino gambling in Massachusetts. And the act established three regions, as shown on the map, and allowed one slot parlor uh, that was not geographically restricted. The Expanded Gaming Act is unique in the United States in establishing a robust research program to help maximize the benefits and minimize the harms 
of casino gambling in Massachusetts. And the research agenda that's contained in Section 171 of the Act has three important elements. These include a comprehensive impact study, a baseline survey of problem gambling, and a review of services before any of the casinos opened. And the third element is other research intended to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of expanded gambling in Massachusetts. This slide presents a timeline of the Commission's process in setting up the research agenda. I'm not going to walk you through the steps. We all uh, pretty much lived through them. Um, but after extensive consultation, uh, the Gaming Commission selected our team based at, the, at UMass Amherst in the School of Public Health and Health Sciences to carry out jointly the first two elements of the research agenda, namely the baseline survey and setting up a system to monitor the social and economic impacts as those rolled out over time. Sigma is based on an approach proposed in a 2011 study uh, funded by the Canadian Consortium for Gambling Research. Uh, not many people realize uh, how many impact studies have actually been done of gambling over the last 30 to 40 years and how few of them actually are of any empirical value whatsoever. Um, so the, uh, the, um, the Canadian Consortium <coughs> study actually identified approximately uh, 500 impact studies that had been done uh, looking at different kinds of gambling and, and their impacts. Uh, they uh, determined that only about 200 of those studies were actually empirical studies and not intended for uh, political purposes. Uh, and they deemed seven of those to have used what they called an excellent methodology. So um, a surprisingly small amount of research on which to build uh, the program that we wanted to build in Massachusetts. So fortunately for us, Rob Williams at the University of Lethbridge is the lead author of this theoretical framework uh, that was proposed based on this review of the literature, and he is a lead member of our team as well. Uh, this slide highlights some of the principles that guide our work to understand the impacts of casino gambling in Massachusetts. And the important thing to understand um, is that the ability to attribute changes uh, to the introduction of casino gambling can be tenuous for many variables. And so um, essentially uh, what we try to do is um, look very systematically at all of the different types of evidence that we are gathering and we deem um, an absence of change to be reasonable evidence of no impact when there is a change in the expected direction uh, that's temporally associated with the introduction of casino gambling, we try to be careful uh, to say only that the change is consistent with a potential impact. We, we, we are reluctant to um, uh, uh, make attribution directly to casino, casino gambling um, unless we're able to triangulate the information uh, with the presence or absence of analogous changes in other variables that are theoretically related to gambling and when other sources of information pertaining to the same variable uh, make more attributions possible. That is, when people in our surveys, for example, say, yes, I experienced a bankruptcy and yes, that bankruptcy was due to my gambling. That's a directly attributable impact. So the focus of our inaugural impact report, which we are launching today, is primarily on Plainville and the slots parlor. And that's because all of the data are from prior to the opening of MGM uh, Springfield. Uh, but we are very excited to finally have um, a report to share with you that's a, a summary report. Uh, we feel that this moment is an important milestone uh, because we are looking back um, at baseline conditions prior to the introduction of casinos in Massachusetts. We're looking at changes uh, related to the introduction of the slot parlor. But most importantly, I think, we are providing a framework or creating a template for what we may see and be able to monitor going forward. So this is sort of the framework that we're going to be following um, over the next 
several years as we produce reports um, looking at uh, the impacts of MGM Springfield and then of Encore Boston Harbor. Um, I'm not going to spend uh, much time at all on this slide. You've seen it many times before, um, but it summarizes our project activities uh, with the uh, various research activities across the top, um, the calendar years on the left side, and the phases of the study on the right side. And essentially, the, the, um, the essence of this slide is that we are moving from the baseline phase um, and into the post-opening um, operational phase. Rachel, just yes. uh, looking at that chart and across the top, could you just remind me um, about the focus group element, what that consists of, what you're looking for? I know you do the key informant interviews, but just remind me again what the focus group piece is. So the focus groups are planned um, uh, not, um, not so much for uh, Plainville, um, because we, did, we didn't feel that there were enough impacts to really sort of um, merit focus groups uh, okay. related to that. Um, further out, when we are um, looking at the full introduction of casino gambling in Massachusetts, uh, we proposed in our original plan to do focus groups with um, people who gambled and with people who had um, problems with their gambling and also with uh, community uh, representatives from the communities um, to try and understand from their perspective and in a qualitative way what they felt the impacts were both positive and negative. Okay. Thank you. So again, on, on this slide, you've seen it many times before, and I'm sure you're all too familiar with it. Uh, this just shows the officially designated host and surrounding communities, um, which are the focus of our regional work. Um, and I just want to um, sort of, as we move into this next part of the presentation, um, uh, indicate that uh, the template that we've developed is to look at state level impacts first and then the same impacts but at the regional level second. Um, and in the case of the regional impacts, uh, the challenge is sometimes to get the data down to um, the, the lowest geography possible. In some cases, that's the host and surrounding communities, but in some other cases, as you'll see, uh, it's the counties within which the, um, the uh, casino operations are located. And, a and in the case of the economic uh, um, REMI modeling, uh, it's actually a six region um, area of uh, map of the, of the state of Massachusetts. So that said, um, the, for the most part in this part of the presentation, focusing on the health, the social and health impacts, um, I will only be talking about areas where we actually identified changes. Um, all of this material and much more is available in the full report, and we're excited to, uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, we've had some uh, hard copies made of the report, so we have one for each of the commissioners. Uh, to carry to your office and use as a weight of some kind, but hopefully to open and, and, uh, and get more detail. Um, there's even greater detail available in the many other reports that are posted on the SIGMA website. Um, given the time constraints, I have not included a list of the reports here, uh, but it is available in the, in the um, summary report and on the uh, SIGMA website as well. So this is a table that shows you the main areas of social and health impacts that we um, are monitoring. Uh, these are primarily impacts that are non-monetary in nature. We rely on uh, many different sources of data to assess social and health impacts. Uh, primary data that you probably are already familiar with include the baseline general population survey, the baseline online panel survey, the targeted surveys in the host and surrounding communities, and our key informant interviews, and eventually uh, the focus groups that we plan to do. We also uh, use a lot of secondary data. Much of it comes from uh, government agencies here in Massachusetts, uh, but some from further afield 
uh, the uh, U.S. Bureau of the Census, for example, and various um, uh, uh, federal agencies. And then the crime data, uh, we actually uh, rely pretty heavily on the work uh, being done by the Gaming Commission's uh, crime analyst, Christopher Bruce. So just very quickly, uh, at the state level, there is no compelling evidence at this time that negative impacts related to problem gambling have increased as a result of casino introduction. For example, this slide shows that statewide admissions for treatment for problem gambling have uh, continued to decline. This slide shows that there has been no uh, detectable increase in statewide personal bankruptcy filings uh, since the opening of the slot parlor. This slide shows similarly that there has been no increase in statewide divorces, restraining orders, or cases of child welfare involvement. All of these things are uh, considered to be um, uh, related indicators uh, to problem gambling. They're quite common uh, when you when you talk to problem gamblers in treatment. These are the kinds of things that they are concerned about and experiencing. Rachel, can I um, just go back a little bit um, to the problem gambling services uh, yes. acceptance. I, I, I've seen this graph before, and um, uh, I always sort of wonder. Uh, the numbers are uh, rather small compared to, uh, to, compared to the indices and, and, mm -hmm. and at risk a population that we know is, is out there from the baseline population survey. But um, could you speak a little bit as to whether the, other people, whether people who are diagnosed or diagnosable as problem gamblers may be seeking help elsewhere or not seeking help uh, but diagnosed and um, how does that play into the analysis? Yeah, so from a big picture perspective, um, problem gambling or, or people who have gambling problems um, experience uh, not only a lot of stigma from outside, but also uh, self or internalized stigma. Um, it's one of the um, uh, mental health disorders that uh, people find very hard to uh, actually admit that they have uh, and to seek help for. Uh, so there's a, a lot of um, not a lot of literature, but there's, there's research to show that only between about 3 and 10 percent of people in a jurisdiction that would be diagnosed as having a, a gambling disorder actually seek out help for that disorder. Um, now, that's not to say that they're not receiving help, uh, because many of them have other disorders, mm -hmm. the, the depression, anxiety, uh, substance use disorders are, the, are, are quite common. Um, amongst people who have gambling problems. And so there's no doubt that um, people with a gambling problem in Massachusetts are seeking out help, uh, but they may not be seeking, or they are clearly not seeking help specifically for a gambling problem. And um, the, the concern uh, is that even if they are seeking out help for another disorder, if they're not screened, for the gambling disorder, if they're not asked any questions about the gambling, um, it remains sort of undetected, and it can actually affect their ability to achieve recovery from the other conditions that they're also seeking help for. So there's a number of reasons why uh, these numbers in uh, Massachusetts are quite low. Um, I think both the self-stigma and the the um, high level of comorbidity are, um, are contributing. Uh, but I think there's also, uh, it's important to understand that the way that um, treatment provision in Massachusetts uh, happens for people with a gambling disorder is that these numbers are only people who don't have any other way to pay for treatment. And so they apply to the Department of Public Health for <clears throat> uh, funding uh, that's not covered by, say, an insurance plan that they have. Um, so these are people who have no health insurance, and I think the decline in numbers may actually also be related to 
um, the introduction of, of universal health, health, health insurance oh. coverage mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, we have some we have some data from another source, uh, looking at the all payer claims data, um, which uh, informs on. Uh, people who do receive a diagnosis of pathological gambling or disordered gambling in Massachusetts, um, but I, it, it's very uh, technical data and um, academically published. Um, we'd be happy to. It, there's information on that in the report, um, but in the in the uh, interest of time, I sort of felt that um, we just wanted to sort of give you a, a, a high-level snapshot of what we were doing. And, and remind me about that um, old player. All payer claims uh, data is uh, the insight essentially the same that uh, treatment has been declining, or has that been no? Uh, actually, steady? Tr uh, diagnoses um, have been quite steady between 2009 and 2012. Um, yep. There's about the same proportion of people each year that have yep. that diagnosis. Okay. Um, and but the interesting thing, or I felt, um, the interesting thing is that they average between one and three or more. Um, other diagnoses as well, mm -hmm. so um, they are quite complicated cases in many in many cases, and teasing out you know what the um, contribution of just their gambling disorder is 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 quite complicated. Okay. Thank you. Okay, back to where I was. Um, so plunging down to the regional level. Uh, we have evidence from the baseline and follow-up targeted surveys that were conducted in uh, 2014 and 2016 in Plainville and surrounding communities. And what this table shows is that there has been uh, no significant change in the rate of problem gambling in uh, the host and surrounding communities subsequent to the opening of Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, you can see that the at-risk rate edged up a little uh, the problem gambling rate edged down a little, uh, but the p-value on the right-hand side uh, indicates that it's a, not a statistically significant difference. Uh, this is an excerpt, actually, from an email that we received uh, in response to a query about attendance at Gamblers Anonymous meetings in uh, the uh, Plainville and uh, surrounding communities area. Uh, they reported that there had been no change in the number of meetings or in the number of people attending the meetings. Similarly, there has been no change um, at the uh, county level in uh, bank personal bankruptcy filings in Norfolk County, where Plainville is situated. Nor has there been an increase in divorces, restraining orders, or cases of child welfare involvement at the regional level. Turning to crime at the state level, uh, there is no evidence that the introduction of a slot parlor in Massachusetts in 2015 had any impact on uh, violent crime or property crime rates. Uh, at the regional level, uh, there has been an increase in crime at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, however, uh, this increase in crime at the slot parlor itself uh, does not appear to have resulted in an increase in overall crime in Plainville and surrounding communities. Uh, Christopher Bruce's work did identify an increase uh, in credit card fraud, reports of lost property, and suspicious activity in Plainville uh, that he deemed likely to be attributable to Plain Ridge Park Casino, but that has abated in the second year after the opening. Uh, in terms of attitudes, uh, this is again from the uh, from the the regional uh, surveys um, at the regional level. Uh, there is some evidence of uh, changes in attitudes towards gambling. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a decrease in the proportion of people who think gambling is not available enough, and an increase in the uh, proportion who believe it's fine. There's a decrease in the number of people or percentage of people who think that casinos are beneficial to Massachusetts and an increase in people in the proportion of people who believe they are neither beneficial nor harmful. Uh, finally, in terms of the uh, environment um, at the uh, regional level, this is a quote from one of our Plainville key informants. Um, as you can see from, from the quote, 
Uh, there were some noise complaints in Plainville associated with the construction of the slot parlor, uh, but there haven't been any uh, complaints since the construction was completed, and so the operations seem to be uh, quite smooth. Finally, this slide shows five years of data from the five traffic stations closest to Plain Ridge Park that have continuous information on two-way traffic. And based on this data plus uh, some information from Christopher Bruce, uh, we've concluded uh, that Plainville has experienced an increase in traffic volume uh, and an increase in traffic complaints. Uh, but that's probably not a surprise uh, since they have a lot more traffic uh, right around uh, where the um, casino or where the slot parlor opened. I'm going to turn it over to Rod at this point so he can give you um, some insights into the economic and fiscal work. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Same caveats apply to my section uh, as Rachel's. This isn't everything that's in the report. It's just the highlights. Uh, more details are available. So I want to first start, um, much as Rachel did, about laying out the framework for the economic component of the analysis. Uh, we have basically three pillars that we're building our analysis on um, that we hope will meet the intentions, the letter and spirit of both legislation and the, uh, the objectives of the MGC. So the first is the uh, economic and community impacts. Uh, you can see that includes mostly information on uh, the businesses and the people and the real estate uh, of the community. We are using that information to produce products such as our host community profiles, our match community analysis, and the real estate analysis that I think was presented just a couple months ago. The next pillar um, are the casino impacts, um, which we're really defining as the information that comes directly out of the casino. So that's the stuff we're learning about uh, who they employ, how much they're paid, who their vendors are, uh, the construction. Um, related to this is the lottery. We're not getting that information from the casinos, but we, we roll it up into our casino impact study. Uh, this is producing products such as the construction operating reports uh, that you've seen, uh, the new employee uh, reports that we've done, uh, and similar things like that. And lastly, we have these special topics. It's sort of the catch-all uh, for items that are um, either too complex to be a simple chapter of uh, a larger ongoing regular product uh, or are sort of, I don't want to say tangentially related, but not directly and immediately related to one of these uh, two other sort of pillars. That would be things like horse racing. Um, we uh, tried to include that into the operating reports, but realized it needed way more time and study and have decided to put that for later for a, a special topic. If and when sports betting were to come, that would be an example of something that we'd look at that way. Uh, and things like tourism, um, workforce, uh, and job quality are some items that we want to think about as uh, future special topics. Rod, just to, to, uh, to touch on this special mm -hmm. topic session, and you and I have had this conversation, I just want to <coughs> reiterate it. Um, you know, with the opening of our class one casinos, we're moving into a whole different realm, different impacts. Um, these were intended, as you know, uh, and you pointed out before that these are to draw tourism to not just be kind of a regional convenience. Um, and I'm hoping that we can begin to look at some of those additional topics that may hint at whether there's an impact on tourism. And it's good government data on local meals tax, local hotel tax that'll figure out if one of our licensees is drawing business away from our surrounding community, whether it's adding to a surrounding community. So, I know you've been thinking about this, and I'm just, again, kind of replanting the seed that as all of you move forward that there's some different components we want to keep in mind. Definitely. We address some tourism uh, through our patron surveys. We ask people what they do outside the casino, how much money they're spending, and so on. Um, but more detailed analysis does need to be done, such as looking at uh, you know, impact of live entertainment venues. Uh, and some of the difficulty we faced um, to you know, borrow a term from the banking industry is some know your customer issues uh, that the current uh, entertainment establishments have. They, they don't know a lot about who their customer 
is or was, mm -hmm. uh, and so it'll be difficult for them to know how their customer has changed, other than simple volume, like we have. We're selling more tickets now than we did, right. um, but they don't necessarily know where their customers are coming from or whether they're local or whether they're not. Um, so that's an, that's an item that we've been thinking about, and we've been talking with uh, Mass Cultural is it Council, Commission, the C's always yep. kept me. Um, and so we've talked with them a little bit about uh, how they could help their members um, and, and help prepare them for perhaps then us coming to talk to them uh, and so forth. So it's a, um, I think this gives you a good idea of why this is a special topic. There has a, it's a lot of threads that we need to gather. There's preliminary work that needs to be done before we can even study it. Um, but it is very much on our agenda. And, and you know, our counterparts over at Mass Office and Travel and Tourism also pay for and collect, as you know, a whole bunch of research data around hotel visits, hotel stops, and, and what it's kind of doing in the region. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to develop a, a process uh, in the not distant future, or quite soon, um, that will help us sort of, you know, prioritize these special topics or deeper dives as we like to think about them and, and figure out a way to sort of, you know, line them up so that we can start addressing them in a systematic way. All right, so um, PPC um, has very much been a test case and test bed for uh, a lot of our ideas and methodologies. Um, due to, I think, its size, um, the, it was easier to study. There was um, le fewer employees, uh, fewer patrons, a smaller construction, um, and simple things like fewer staff just uh, finding the right person to talk to uh, and to get the information. All that is significantly easier um, with a, a small property like PPC. So it has allowed us to develop an analytical framework that we have refined over the past few years that we are now uh, porting forward uh, to our analyses of the casinos in Springfield and effort. So here are the um, dimensions that we are focusing on uh, for in the economic uh, analysis. Again, we're not going to talk about every single one of these here, um, but this does give you an example of, of the types of information that you're going to be able to find in the report, uh, in the big summary report, and in um, other individual reports that we've already done and published. So uh, if you're thinking about direct economic impacts, um, from PPC, uh, we have found uh, direct benefits from both its construction and operation at the state and regional level. Um, while we have not done full analyses of um, the two other casinos, um, we have no reason to expect that their construction impacts um, would not be similarly beneficial. Um, we haven't. We don't have anything to say about their operations impacts yet, but um, we have no reason to believe that their construction impacts at this point wouldn't be anything other than beneficial. Uh, so the construction of PPC, we focused, uh, so the number you're going to see here, the 150 million, uh, that differs from the total investment number uh, because this is really just talking about the construction, whereas total investment also includes a lot of uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, which uh, we did not measure as part of the construction impact. So we have $150 million uh, was spent to build uh, the, renovate the grandstand and racetrack, build the casino, the new casino building, and put up the new parking garage. Uh, as you can see, the majority of that money was spent in Massachusetts um, on Massachusetts suppliers. Uh, that's not to say that the drywall was manufactured in Massachusetts, but rather that the drywall supplier would have been Massachusetts-based. Um, of that sum, about $21.5 million um, was construction wages. Uh, and the big imports to Massachusetts were structural steel, which came from Quebec, uh, kitchen equipment, which came from Florida, and the gaming machines themselves, which came uh, primarily from Nevada. In terms of employment, um, if you counted the number of people who were on site, uh, who were, were on site at least once in a given quarter, and you average that out, it worked out to about 554 individuals passed through the construction site in an average quarter. That's not annualized or an FTE. We'll get to that in a minute, but this is just sort of a count of bodies. Um, of those people, uh, I don't know why this isn't showing correctly, so I'll read those to you. Um, in the Massachusetts is 450. That's 81.4%. Uh, 
Uh, and the blue slice, that's the, the big gray slice, the blue slice is Rhode Island, which is 79 or 14 percent. So you can see primarily the workers were either Massachusetts residents uh, or uh, Rhode Island residents. We're actually surprised, in a way, to see so few Rhode Island residents given the proximity to Rhode Island and the fact that, at least when this was happening, uh, its construction industry hadn't fully recovered from the recession, so there was uh, idle labor there to be had. So uh, it was, uh, they did a pretty good job hiring uh, Massachusetts-based workers. So if you take the 554 <coughs> bodies uh, and you annualize them into sort of a, an annual construction worker, uh, that turns into about 500 annualized construction workers. If you spread them across the site um, over the two years, you'll get the bottom, the red part of the, the bars here, so 267 and 234. If you then look at the total economic impacts of employing these people and spending $150 million on construction, uh, you get the total employment um, impacts, which are labeled at the top of those columns, 576 and 540. If you add it all up over two years, you basically have 501 annual jobs, um, create an additional 615 uh, for a total of about 1,100. So for every one construction job, we found an additional one and a quarter uh, jobs. These 1,100 jobs came with about $91.5 million of income, uh, and 30% uh, of all these jobs were created or supported outside of Bristol and Norfolk County, so um, outside of the, the main um, impact zone. So here's a um, table with uh, gaming revenue, which uh, I'm sure you're all quite familiar with. Um, on top of that, we estimated some non-gambling revenue there. You'll see in the second to right column, the, second, the column second from the right. Um, what you'll find that's not entirely surprising given the amenities at the site is that the vast majority of the revenue is gaming revenue. Uh, from our patron surveys, we also estimated an additional $4 million of off-site spending um, from visitors on things like retail, gas, food, um, lodging, et cetera. I'm going to skip a couple of slides forward because we basically talked about all of that. So um, in the interest of time, we'll just progress to the one with the uh, pie chart here, direct casino expenditure and revenue. So this is the sources of the operating revenue. So continuing on money flowing into the casino, um, we have a sense of what the total revenue is. And now we want to look at where the money is coming from. Um, so where do the patrons live? Uh, what we found is basically three quarters of the patrons are from Massachusetts. So that's the black and the gray slices together. Uh, and then basically the remainder is out of state or unknown. Um, what's interesting to note though, moving on to the next slide, is just because three quarters of the patrons are from Massachusetts, it doesn't mean that three quarters of the revenue uh, going to PPC is being taken away from uh, Massachusetts-based activities. Uh, as you all know, one of the um, one of the things that the state was trying to achieve with legalizing the commercial casinos was to recapture money that's already being spent by Massachusetts residents out of state on gambling. So this money is already in household budgets. It's um, already factored into their consumption. So the idea is that if we can just change the geographic location of where the spending is occurring, uh, that would be net new money to the Commonwealth. And so what we did find is, in fact, of the in-state patrons, uh, or 58 percent of the total revenue at the casino was recaptured uh, in state resident spending. So this is money that was previously going to gambling in Rhode Island and Connecticut primarily that has now come back in. An additional 20 percent was out of state uh, and that really only leaves about 20 percent of the total revenues at PPC um, were dollars that were previously being spent in Massachusetts that have been reallocated away from some other business uh, to PPC. So I think we found that to be um, a welcome finding in terms of uh, the overall economic impacts. So now if we look at change our frame from money coming into the casino to money going out, um, we, uh, we found that uh, PPC spent about $130 million on, on expenses. Um, a good portion of that, as we'll get into in a little bit, is taxes on GGR. Um, but a significant sum was also spent on vendors, uh, payments to a uh, host and surrounding communities. Uh, a big chunk of this was in-state, which is, again, uh, beneficial. And then you see about $18 million going to wages. Their employment base 
uh, is um, primarily Massachusetts based, but we found about a third uh, live out of state. And thinking about net job creation, um, when we asked new hires um, what their previous employment status was, we found that basically 50% of them were either unemployed or employed part-time um, prior to accepting this job at PPC. For context, um, if rec my memory serves, I think about three-quarters of all the jobs at PPC are full-time. Uh, so uh, some of these unemployed and part-time workers are, have moved into full-time work. Just the math has to work that way. Um, what is worth pointing out that those half that were previously employed full time, that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a net job created. It just means it could have been pushed down the line. So if I was employed full time at company A and I'm not PPC, company A now has a vacancy that they need to advertise uh, and fill. So or they, they can improve their productivity, which also in the long run will help, help the economy. So one way or another, um, and these are either improving productivity or helping uh, create net jobs. Expanding on to the ripple effects of these jobs, what is particularly interesting about Plain Ridge Park that we don't expect to see uh, in the Category 1 casinos is this differentiation in the impact attributable to the operation of the casino itself uh, and the impact attributable to um, utilizing its tax uh, payments. Um, as I just mentioned, 49% uh, of their gross gaming revenue goes to taxes, which is much higher than the tax rate that's going to be paid um, by the Category 1 casinos. And the, the, the statutory allocation of this tax money is considerably different. All of this money uh, goes, uh, well, primarily, all of the money goes into local aid, which gets then distributed to cities and towns to be spent at their discretion, whereas the Category 1 uh, tax revenues uh, are allocated into many different pots um, with many different purposes. So what we see here, if you look at just the 500 or so employees at PPC and look at the ripple effects of their, of their employment and the operation, uh, we get about 780 total jobs. So you get a ripple effect. Uh, that's not nothing, um, but, um, but uh, smaller than that total headline number will imply that 2,400. That big increment comes from taking 80 some odd million dollars and injecting it into local government spending. Um, we assume that all that money gets spent uh, and we assume that it gets spent based on the existing patterns of spending that local governments um, have used in the past. And that's what creates that, that big uh, total employment number. Um, it's worth pointing out that if this is roughly 50-50, why is 50% of the revenue creating 780 jobs and 50% of the revenue is creating 1,600 jobs? Uh, the reason for that is uh, government spending is highly labor intensive. It's, uh, if you think about what government services are, it's almost all people provided. Uh, and so it, you tend to have a lot of employees per dollar of government spending. Uh, their supply chains also tend to be highly local, so you tend to get a bit more uh, in-state circulation of money. Um, Moving on to lottery sales, um, what you'll see on the, right, the left-hand side of that vertical line uh, is what happened in the a Plain Ridge Park property, Plainville and the state prior to the opening of the casino and then after the opening of the casino. So what you'll see is that relative to, its, rel relative to when it was just a racetrack, basically, uh, the casino has, has selling considerably more lottery products. Um, we're seeing, what is that, four, five, six times more uh, lottery products than it did um, previously, with no discernible reduction in sales in the rest of Plainville uh, or the state. So it, it seems that the data so far seems to suggest that the, the in increase in lottery sales at the casino proper hasn't come with any uh, related reductions in lottery sales elsewhere. Uh, and lastly, just to reiterate this, uh, distribution of local aid question. So we have $166 million of GGR. Of that, 81.4 million is uh, tax money. That's, that goes into, uh, is taxed. And of that, the share that goes to local aid is $66 million. And that subtracts the share that goes to the um, horse racing fund. Um, and that gets distributed um, based on the existing formula for local aid, which weights both population and let's call it economic distress 
uh, in deciding uh, where the money goes. So the allocation of the taxes on GGR of PPC have nothing to do with whether cities uh, have, uh, uh, whether their hosts are surrounding communities, uh, how they voted um, for um, the, in the referendum for the casinos, it has nothing to do with their lottery sales. Uh, it is, it, it goes into local aid pots and gets distributed uh, based on that formula, which again, to reiterate, will be entirely different from what we're gonna see for the category one casinos. Uh, and that does it for my part, and I'll hand it back over to Rachel to uh, talk to you about talk to you about our future work. Okay, we'll try and make this brief, but I'm sure you'll have some questions for us. Um, so, uh, what we want to do is, um, first of all, just sort of provide you with um, a graphic summary of the results, uh, both on the social and health side and on the economic and fiscal side. Uh, we divided these into statewide impacts and regional impacts. And what this and the next slide summar uh, do is um, sort of summarize the types of changes. Overall, what this slide shows is that there have been few changes in social and health impacts related to the introduction of casino gambling in Massachusetts at either the statewide or the regional level. There have been some changes uh, in attitudes, both more positive and more negative and some environmental impacts that were identified, but only at the regional level. It's important to emphasize uh, that these impacts likely uh, will be different, uh, most certainly at the regional level when it comes to looking at Springfield and Everett going forward. Uh, this slide shows that the economic and fiscal impacts have clearly been positive, and particularly at the regional level. Mm. There have been increases in statewide and regional revenues. There have been improvements in employment and wages. Uh, there have been no changes in real estate conditions. And as Rod just indicated, there have been increases both in government revenue, but also in government spending. So going forward, we have um, quite a number of data collection and reporting activities planned for the current fiscal year. Uh, this slide shows you what we are uh, currently working on, um, including our first uh, patron survey um, at MGM. And uh, we haven't talked about the cohort study today, but we do have wave five of the cohort study planned to go into the field in March, next, uh, in March 2019. Uh, we also have quite a number of reports uh, that are going to be coming at you. Um, and we look forward to presenting those results as they come through the review process and are ready to be shared. Uh, the next fiscal year, fiscal year 2020, um, includes, again, quite a lot of data collection as well as a number of deliverables in the form of uh, focused reports. Uh, we have proposed and uh, look forward to discussing uh, with Mark Vanderlinden and others at the Commission um, the idea of conducting a targeted follow-up survey in fiscal year 2020 uh, in Springfield and surrounding communities. Uh, we'll be doing the second wave of the MGM patron survey and the first wave of the first Encore uh, patron survey. We'll be doing key informant interviews and I uh, believe we also um, are planning to do focus groups uh, in Springfield. We'll have wave six of the cohort study also in the field that fiscal year. Um, and a number of uh, quite focused reports that we plan to produce in fiscal year 2020. Uh, one year after the opening of Encore Boston Harbor, we will be doing a tremendous amount of primary data collection, which includes primarily the follow-up general population survey and the follow-up online panel survey. Uh, we will be doing uh, key informant interviews and focus groups. Uh, and using the follow-up general population survey as a foundation, we are um, hoping to be able to transition to a more cost-effective data collection approach uh, to monitor gambling participation and problem gambling uh, going forward in Massachusetts. Um, so that will be subject to uh, quite a lot of discussion with other experts, both at the Gaming Commission um, or working with the Gaming Commission and uh, within our team and amongst uh, the scholarly community. 
The following year, fiscal year 2022, is uh, going to be largely focused on reporting uh, because that's when we anticipate producing our next summary report, which will um, include results from all of this work that we're going to be doing for the next few years. And with that, um, we have uh, a couple of places that you can go and look for more information. And I think Alyssa now has uh, some large reports to share with you. Nice and glossy. It's exciting oh. to have something in, in, you know, like real to hold. Are these autograph copies? Sorry? No, they're not autographed. There's too many members of the team. <laughs> Sorry, Bruce. Thank you. Do we have questions of the team? Um, let me just comment that, you know, we've, we've seen uh, um, before some of the detailed reports uh, that, um, that form part of this summary, but it's always not very nice to see uh, um, a summary in this, in this way. Um, I think um, you spoke to a couple of the, of the real reasons of the Gaming Act. Uh, the recapture of the revenue um, was, was, was very good, good to, um, to ascertain in Plainridge. I really look forward to how that plays out on, um, on the Category 1s, on, on MGM, starting with MGM. Um, and the general notion that at least uh, so far, the impacts, the social impacts have been, you know, the same or, or, or not really attributable to, to casinos. Um, I think, um, of course, that's only predicated on a smaller operation. There will be larger operations, as you pointed out. Um, the good news in my mind is that there's mitigation money that comes to, um, to this body and others uh, to try to address those, um, what those impacts might be. Um, so we are, we're always eager to find out about those so that we can address those in the way to, um, that's, that's appropriate because the whole point of doing all this research is to inform policy and policymakers uh, and whatnot. Um, also with the caveat that some of the, um, that from what we've learned is that social costs tend to be lagging while economic costs are observed um, quicker, <laughs> immediate, um, yeah. as, as perhaps uh, alluded to here. Uh, but um, the flip side of that point is that perhaps um, with so much um, availability of gambling nearby, Massachusetts' uh, residents are somehow already adapted to the availability of, of, of gambling. Um, so there's multiple factors that operate here to the ultimate findings that you describe in this, in this report quite well. Uh, but um, if nothing else, I just want to point for the record that we're always studying at those, uh, how those factors interact uh, with, the, with each other as, as we continue to move forward into additional research. And, and I would just like to add that, um, you know, it'll be really nice, this report, uh, it's speaking with, uh, and I've said this before, but speaking with colleagues from other jurisdictions, um, everyone's so interested in this research. And, you know, having real-time information rather than anecdotal is, is really important. You mentioned sports betting uh, as, a, as a topic for the future. Um, we're seeing that right now where everybody's speculating on what the impacts will be mm -hmm. and uh, the ability to, to look at things this comprehensively um, I think is, is really, uh, really important. And if I can mention, just expand a little bit on a point you made, uh, Dr. Wahlberg and their team have been very good at, uh, and flexible at reacting at some of the uh, priorities that have come up uh, from time to time. Uh, I actually remember we had to, be, because of the referendum and a number of things, our original uh, plan uh, that you actually um, reminded us here had to shift a little bit, had to be, certain things had to be postponed because, you know, our original assumptions just didn't pan out that way. Um, that's also, happy, that, that has been a very good uh, working model um, from, from our standpoint, uh, Rachel, so we thank you for that. I, I suspect we may have, you know, a couple of those uh, in the future, and we'll we'll continue. We'll have to continue to address those as they uh, as they come along. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I, I, I would just like to add, um, I mean, it's, it's great work. I, I still hearken back to the day Rachel sat in front of Enrique and I and brought up this provision, and Enrique and I were, wow, we have to do research. Um, but, you know, is, is we kind of continue this evolution, and as Enrique pointed out, there's great information for policymakers and policyholders. We collect a lot of information that's generated locally around these facilities, and, um, you know, at some point it'd be great to think about how some of that information could be shared back with local stakeholders and see how they could benefit by having a lot of, I mean, we collect crime information. It's great information give us, given to us by the local um, uh, law enforcement agencies, but looking for those opportunities where we've got this great piece of information, how can we share it back with local stakeholders and give them an opportunity to, to benefit by it or react to it, but hopefully, you know, benefit from it in a positive way. Well, I, I think you, you actually um, touched on something very, very important, Commissioner Stebbins, is, um, you know, the the point of doing research um, is is not just to find out what's going on, it's to um, feed into a process of um, assisting positive change. And so, you know, we're very cognizant of the fact that this information is feeding into a policy and regulatory process, uh, but we have also been very aware all along that there's a need to uh, share information with local folks at the community level and uh, increasingly um, to try and figure out how to engage people at the community level with help helping us understand what their research needs are and helping them conduct that research if, if that is what they want to do. Um, so Alyssa has uh, these fact sheets, for example, which are very much intended to share information about key aspects of the SIGMA study um, with uh, folks at the community level. Um, do we have them up here? Um, I'm not sure. If I'm not sure. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Alyssa. Um, so basically, uh, this is a set of 10 fact sheets. Uh, they address um, the uh, Expanded Gaming Act itself, uh, the, uh, um, the organization of the project. Uh, she, she, how did they get in there? Oh, it's a, oh, it's a from, from, I see. Okay. It's on the right, <laughs> yes. right? It's a trick. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, um, and then the, the remaining uh, eight okay. fact sheets that are in there um, address uh, gambling participation, uh, some of the economic impacts, and uh, then uh, finally a summary of the first uh, um, findings from the cohort study. Uh, so we thought these would be of interest uh, to um, folks who are not researchers, but this is a way to sort of translate the results uh, in a, into a format that um, anybody can use. Um, we think that these will be of interest to legislators, for example, uh, but uh, perhaps even more importantly to people at the community level uh, who don't want to, you know, even read a, a report, uh, but just want to sort of know, you know, like what's the headline um, around one particular finding. Um, if I may add that, that actually, Commissioner Stebbins, your point is also, I think, captured and um, we're in the midst of a research strategic planning process. Um, and two areas that I think are of, are of focus um, that we'll be looking to expand upon um, and enhance is one is, is community-driven research. So working with the community, let them define what the, the research questions are, what the methods are, um, and in collaboration with the, the Gaming Commission, collaboration with um, the SIGMA team and our partners at the Department of Public Health um, to conduct that research to, to, to answer those questions. Um, and the second piece of it is um, uh, knowledge translation. So exactly what you said. How do you take the, the research that's being created this, this body of evidence um, and translate it into a way that makes sense and can be operationalized into policy and practice. Um, there are very specific strategies to do that, and uh, we look over the, the coming year and years um, to enhance that part of, of the research uh, program. 
Yeah, I know the team and others are not here, uh, members of our Gaming Research Advisory Committee and others have spent, uh, our Research Review Committee, spent quite a bit of time uh, giving feedback on, on, on this process of uh, creating these fact sheets as well as the knowledge translation as, as we go forward. Uh, because um, in a very, uh, in a heavy dose of irony, um, one of the um, um, results of doing so much research is that it becomes, we become to drown our own, um, our own research in a way. Uh, because there's more uh, always coming, uh, and it's important to be able to leave the public and you know and, and policymakers who might not have the time uh, or the wherewithal to spend throughout all of the the research uh, document uh, with really the key findings and um, and it's 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 not it's not always a, a straightforward but it's I think this, this is a great effort. I really sheets as well and it, you know as many people communities in particular would I think be very interested in uh, having a pretty quick way to just assess exactly what's going on okay. good work thank you thank you thank to the you. whole team okay Can next we make a break? yep oh. we have a request for a five-minute break we'll take that now thank you Okay, we will reconvene public meeting 256 at this time and welcome the racing division. Dr. Leipam. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today we have the uh, 2017 annual report for uh, the racing division. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to thank Mike Sangalang for doing his magic on our report. Uh, he's got some great pictures in it and um, helped format it in a nice uh, manner. <clears throat> also, uh, Doug O'Donnell and uh, Chad Bork put considerable time into this report also. Um, just in general, for um, the 2017 year, um, one of the highlights was getting new computers for all our staff out in the field. Um, I'd like to thank the IT department for working on that. Um, we did a lot of cross-training. Um, people that, uh, that were in the test area learned um, the um, licensing procedures so they could help out. Um, our test barn coordinator also did that. Um, she did some shadowing in the judges stand. Um, the, um, uh, one of our licensing folks out at Suffolk worked with Doug O'Donnell on some of the account wagering. Mm -hmm. So we really tried to make it so that if anybody was out, um, we would have coverage for everything because we're a fairly small um, division. Um, also, we tried to make sure that our employees got um, training um, to keep up with the latest. Um, Justin Stempak from the legal department and I went to the annual um, RCI conference to keep up with the best practices and all on the uh, racing industry. Um, Chris Miller, our test barn coordinator, took the um, racing officials accreditation program um, school for judges training and passed that exam. Um, Sal Panzer, one of our judges, uh, they have to renew every two years, and that was his year to uh, renew his continuing ed, so he did that also. Um, and then our state police unit um, went to the Organization of um, Racing Investigators uh, Conference to learn the latest investigative techniques. So we're trying to keep everybody up to date. Uh, so looking at our report, um, first of all, we'll go to the page on uh, Suffolk Downs. Um, they increased their race days from six to eight. Um, and that, um, you know, led to an increase in uh, number of races, which was significant. They um, had 29 more races in uh, 2017 versus 16. Um, that allowed 259 more horses to start. Um, their average field size actually improved from 7.4 to 7.9. And they gave out about a million more in um, purses. So that was a significant increase. Um, it's amazing what just a couple of days can do. Um, going on to Plain Ridge Park, um, they increased their number of days from 115 to 125. Um, their number of races went up um, about 100. Um, they're <clears throat> um, uh, significantly with the sire stakes. They incre were able to increase their number of races and um, more importantly, um, in 2016, only one of those um, was a wagering race, and in uh, 2017, 14 of those were wagering races. That was a big um, improvement. So you can see that the um, Massachusetts breeding on the standard red side is really taking off and improving. Where, um, can you just point to that number again? 
So I'm on page 16. Um, that page just gives the stats for uh, 2017, um, but the numbers I've told, I've compared it um, for you, giving um, some of the numbers from 2016 to show how it's increased. Yeah, but the breeding, the breeding piece, I was interested. Okay, just so remind on, me that, um, that one. On uh, where it says 2017 racing stats, and it says total number of races. Um, it's got 1,202. And then um, it gives the overnights, and then it has 20 mass sire stakes, and in parentheses, oh. non wagering, and then 14 mass sire stakes wagering. Yes. So that um, 14 for 2017 um, would be compared to the one race in 2016. Right. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, their um, average field size went up from 7.22 in 2016 to 7.42 in 2017. And um, they gave out about 2 million more in um, purses um, in 17 than they did in 16. So again, um, those amounts are going, went up significantly. On um, page 17, at the bottom, we talk about the um, uh, racehorse developments funds that were distributed um, <clears throat> for the thoroughbred accounts. It's uh, about three and a half million. The year before that, it was two and a half. Um, and for the harness accounts, it's 6.5, and it was 5.9 the year before. So again, there was a significant increase in the amount of racehorse development funds that were given out. So I'm on to page 18 now under licensing. <clears throat> the um, licensing stayed um, consistent, which is uh, great to see. Um, the um, number of applications was was similar. We had about an increase of about 200. Um, and one thing to remember with the um, licensing is that um, we instituted uh, the possibility of a one, two, or three year license being taken out in 2015. So it's been very popular at Plain Ridge. So a lot of the um, people at Plain Ridge may have a two or three year license, so they don't actually get counted in these numbers because our system only um, records the financial part of the transaction. So those transactions were, were calculated in earlier years. So this is still significant that we're still getting like 1,000 um, people licensed um, in a year like that, even though a lot of people that are returning may have taken out a two or three year one. Hmm. But that's not the case with Suffolk Downs. They're only li being at licensed Suffolk, one year at, uh, at Suffolk, at they time. have the option, but where the um, racing is um, a little more uncertain, most people have only taken out a year. We have had people that have taken out two or three year licenses, but it's very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> again, um, our fees um, and number of licenses issued were um, very similar from 16 to 17, um, which I think um, is great. Um, testament to the interest in the racing. Um, we're still issuing, you know, a thousand licenses at Suffolk, and um, you know, we um, issued a little over a thousand at Plain Ridge. And again, you've got to remember that there's actually more people than that license at Plain Ridge because of the multi-year factor. Um, the troopers numbers vary a little bit, just depending on whatever may um, be going on at the track at the time. There wasn't any um, anything really significant in a change there. <clears throat> um, going on to page 24 under laboratory services, um, the uh, number of samples that we took obviously went up um, because there was uh, considerable more days of racing. And um, there is a list of all the different either overages for therapeutic medications or um, positives for um, other drugs. Um, and it's interesting because in uh, 2016, we had 16 overages of the controlled therapeutic medication program and 10 positives. And in 17, we had um, 15 controlled therapeutic overages and uh, 10 positives. So it's virtually the same, which is um, great because proportionally, we obviously we had a lot more races in 17. So the proportionally, the number of um, drug positives and overages went down. Dr. Lightbaum, can we attribute that to something? Um, I'm Our not oversight. Sure. Our oversight. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, couldn't you? 
Yeah, I mean, we've made a big effort to try to educate everybody. We put out a, a trainer's manual um, that's on our website. We hand it out in our office. It's um, in the um, office down in the test in the test barn and in the um, uh, paddock judge's office. So it's very available. It's online um, to try to make sure everybody um, knows. We're, uh, the therapeutic medication list now has been out there for five years, and it's occasionally updated. Um, those are. Um, that was an effort to um, recognize that there are medications that um, are legitimately used in athletes, just like a human taking aspirin on a horse, same similar thing. Um, you just don't necessarily want it um, given the day of the race. And um, so there's uh, levels that are acceptable um, and there's um, some guidelines as to how those medications can be given to um, mm -hmm. make sure that you're under those. and. Um, we just stress that with those. I know, I, I know that there would be, uh, it's, it's hard to find causation, direct causation, but I, I, I really believe that when, when people know that we're constantly sampling uh, um, or, or um, testing mm -hmm. the winners and uh, randomly another horse and those samples are being kept securely and, and sent to an accredited lab uh, and uh, there's the occasional um, case that gets to what the hearing officer and gets to us about somebody who went over uh, you know the, the threshold etc people people know that they need to um, take all of these uh, matters very seriously and look at the manual as you suggest and and, and learn about all, all of those uh, thresholds yes and our lab is good we they have um, several different programs they'll offer to the trainers if, if they have questions about how they're giving the medications and all um, and um, we also post all of our um, rulings, so it's it's very transparent. Once they've had the ruling, the judges have made their decision. It's posted in the um, racing building, um, and it's also online. Um, and we keep a there's a book that we keep a binder, um, and that's left out. And the trainers have access to that um, basically any time they can want to come into that building. So um, mm -hmm. they can even go in that building when um, nobody's in the building. That part is open. Um, left open and so if they want to come in and flip through those um, and, and see what rulings we've had you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's right there uh, and, by, and by the way along the same lines um, is it fair to say that we have uh, a community of you know, the, the, the same number of pe the same people uh, com coming year to year because if we had a lot of new people let's say or a lot of rotation then you know there would be at least more of a need for um, more education or, or why not? Right, and, and we do have a lot of new people coming in, um, particularly okay. at Suffolk. Um, that's a whole, a, a lot of new people. Um, huh. And at Plain Ridge, we also have a, where the purses have gotten better. Um, we have seen a big increase in, in more people coming from other tracks okay. for the day and that type of thing. Um, one of the fortunate things is um, with RCI trying to um, promote uniformity, between the, the different states, and part of it's that therapeutic medication program. Yes. Um, everybody should be on that same page, you know. So if they're racing in New York or Maine or New Jersey, they should they be under that same program. Um, okay. Some some of the um, states have a slightly different uh, thing on certain drugs. Uh, I think New York still has a difference on their clenbuterol level, but um, the trainers are aware that you know mm -hmm. there's a difference in things like that, and, and they're aware that um, in Massachusetts we follow the RCI rules. RCI rules so. Okay, so we couldn't really take all the credit then. <laughs> we, we can take partial credit I though. Partial. I, I would agree that we can. I think by reading, you mentioned this, Commissioner, when an appeal does uh, make its way to us, um, when we look at those reports, it's really apparent that uh, whether it be the folks in the test barn or our judges, um, you know, the work is very professional. We are following uh, model rules, and, um, you know, that's, it's a pleasure to read those reports due to the fact that we see that things are being done according to, um, according to uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. So it's a tribute to you and your staff. Well, thank you. And um, Justin Stempak has been a great help uh, for us. He handles the appeals, and um, he does training with the judges um, at the beginning of the year. I attend those also so that, um, you know, we're all on the same page. And then um, he's very good about um, if something gets appealed, he follows up with us on what we need to do to help him out on um, his part of it. You know, I would like to attend that 
training when he comes up next. Great. Just yep. just to see it. Yeah, it's very. And maybe learn something, frankly. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's see. So, um, as far as uh, rulings for 2017 at Suffolk. Um, they issued five rulings, um, and um, that was mainly there was a, a drug positive there, which we really hadn't had drug positives at Suffolk at these, um, you know, the boutique meet uh, that they'd been doing, um, and then there was an issue with um, a claimed horse, so that was, um, you know, not a big jump, but it was a little bit of a difference from before. Um, at Plain Ridge, the number of rulings actually went down slightly. There were 129 in 2016, and there were 123 in 2017. Um, there, uh, we had the same board of judges um, that we had in the second half of 16 going into 17. So I think it was, you know, pretty consistent on um, what they were, uh, how they were uh, doing things. One thing that we do to try to um, help the horsemen out as well is at the beginning of the season, there's a meeting <clears throat> um, before the first day of racing with the trainers and um, drivers, um, grooms, anybody who's there can come down and the um, judges address them and um, Steve O'Toole does, um, I do, um, just with um, some of the highlights of what's expected. Um, and if there's any new um, rules that have come up over the winter, we talk about that um, and go through that. So uh, again, uh, it's we would encourage people to follow the rules. We're not looking to on a kind of a get you thing. We would prefer everybody just follow the rules. But if they don't, then you know we'll follow up with the consequences. Okay. So. Um, and I think that pretty much um, brings up. Uh, the part that I'll give, I'll turn it over to Doug O'Donnell. We did have um, something that we discovered this morning on our um, expenditures um, that we're going to have to um, go back and, and um, correct those numbers. Um, as you know, with um, racing, we operate on a calendar year and our um, reports are calendar year and uh, most everybody else goes on a fiscal year. So we had a little bit of an issue um, converting from one to the other. So we'll make that correction. And also, we've noticed a couple of uh, typos, so um, we'll um, also address those before we make it public. Now I'll turn it over to Doug. Okay. Good morning, Commission. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Um, so if we go to page 30, where the uh, racing financials are, again, what Alex said is it's uh, based on a calendar year basis. So this is for 2017. And the total receipts for that year were $2,646,601, which is down approximately 300000 from the prior year, which we, we can discuss later in the, in the um, report. Um, as she said, the expenditures, we had an issue with the calendar year, fiscal year, so we will not be reviewing those, and that will have an effect on the following page as well. The program revenues are accurate, but with the additional program expenses, it's going to uh, throw off the bottom line there. So. Again, a revision will be will be submitted to you. Um, so if we go to page 32, handle and revenue by track. Live and on track handle, we had a total of 219 million, uh, 10,295 dollars, and that was up uh, from the prior year, which is approximately 209 million. Uh, commission and fees were. 2,081,404, which were, were down a little bit from the prior year, and the outs were 565,197,000, hundred and the prior year was 582. So those, those outs remain somewhat consistent. Uh, then we have uh, commission business on page 33. If we want to go to page 35, it's a handle comparison. Uh, comparing 2016 to 2017, uh, total live handle, we had an increase of 25 percent, which is attributable to um, the additional race days. We had um, 115 at Plain Ridge Park in 16 and 125 race days in 2017. In Suffolk, we had six race days in 16 and eight race days in 17. Um, 
if we go down the next, the total import, uh, we were up 4.21 percent. And on the exports, we were up uh, 20 percent, which also would be attributable to the additional race days, which gives us a total increase for all um, handles of 5.8 percent. So on the following page, it'll do, show the handles, which you just went over, 5.8 uh, percent in the commissions. Uh, in 2017, you'll see uh, the first line item there of commissions. We we're actually down 23 percent, and that is due to the fact that the dog handle commission Change. was reduced last year from 2.5 percent to 0.375 percent. So that's a significant reduction. That's the, you know that's why the difference is there. So and that was that was a permanent reduction. Remind me, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. And that was at the beginning of last year. So we, yes. we saw that from you the know, beginning. big difference. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, uh, analysis of purses paid 2017. We always do a comparison between 2016 and 17. Um, as you can see in 16, the Plain Ridge Park purses were 7.9 million, and this year they were 9.9 .9 million. And Suffolk Downs was 2.7, and compared to 3.8 for this year. Doug, can I go go back a little bit to yep. the handle comparison on page 35? Yep, 35. Yeah, on the import. Help me understand the import and the export. Okay. The import in Plain Ridge went down. Yes. While Suffolk went up. Mm -hmm. um, how is that? Again, Suffolk includes all the ADWs. Um, oh, of course. So that's, you know, they, they did have an increase of handles there. Yeah. Plain Ridge was down moderately. Um, and that, you know, that varies year in and year out. I mean, they were only down 1.6 percent, but they're you can see their, um, their, export their is exports increased. increased. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, they stay within a, a certain parameters in terms of what their, their handles are. So. But, but the export is positive, and I guess that's a positive development from the additional purses. Right. Now our, our races are being watched elsewhere exactly. with, more, with these outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Better well, product. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. OK. Okay, so if we go to uh, page 38, the Suffolk Downs financial report. Um, again, there are live handles up. You can, we also include uh, the ADWs, which are, are in there. Uh, and their total handle is up over 10% for the year. Okay, and along with that, their total revenues were also up close to 10%, 8.5%. That's great. Uh, the next page is their uh, capital improvement trust fund and promotional trust fund. They have a significant balance in their their cap fund. Uh, they they started off the year with um, 810,000 revenues into it was 784,000. Um, they did have some expenditures out of there, and their balance at the end of calendar year 2017 was 815,000. So again, they're you know they're working with us and sub submitting their RFCs for the cap fund, but we'd like to see more come in to reduce this. They would too. So, but it's uh, just taking a little time. In their uh, promotional trust fund, um, they are in a deficit. They have submitted uh, RFCs for the promotional fund, which far exceed what's in there. So they are in what's what's been submitted. Uh, they're in a uh, deficit of 654,000. So as that fund increases, they will submit an RFR for us to to get that money out to them. Okay, moving on to page 40, it's Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, again, you can see the overall handle is up 5.6 percent. Exports have a, a play in that in the. Um, the total revenues are down. Once again, it's due to the, um, the the dog handle commission because that was reduced. And moving forward on page 41, the their capital improvement trust fund. 
Uh, they started off the year with 289,000. They have taken, they have done some significant work there. Um, program revenue that went in was 185,000, and the end of calendar year 17, they had 124,000. Um, with their promotional trust fund, they started off the year in a deficit, but they have put additional monies in there, 58,000, and they currently have 21,000 in there now. Okay. So the revenues at Plain Ridge are impacted by the dog? Yes, because they take casting? dog signals there. They do? Yes, they do. Yep. Okay. And that's primarily what the difference is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we go to uh, page 43, Raynham Park, uh, their overall signals were down uh, approximately 7% from the prior year. And the biggest impact on, on their revenues was the uh, commissions because the majority of their handles are from dogs. So that's why they had a uh, big decrease in that. And with Wonderland, uh, their handles are also endowed significantly, and that's because Suffolk Downs last year took dog handles on the Suffolk license, okay? So they've taken a fair amount of dog hand, um, signals and put them over in Suffolk. And again, that's the same with the... Oh, really? Yes. Because yeah. it's now more economical? Or is the market bearing that? Or it's... Is it Whatever the market bears. Whatever the market bears, okay. So, okay. and that shows, a, um, again, a, a big decrease in their, in their total revenues. And on page 45, I would just like to point out the smile on Commissioner Stebbins' face. <laughs> he was our honorary pea catcher for the day, and he was carrying around his, uh, his work. So we all, well, we holding, all at MGC want to thank I'm holding an empty bucket. It's empty. It's a water bucket. It's, it's a water bucket. It's a water okay. bucket. So that was a prop? <laughs> yes. Um, any kind of just industry, but I mean, Florida just went through their recent election. They are banning dog racing. Right. Is so that Go going to the California market? 20. That it really hasn't had an effect on us as of yet because a lot of the, the, the major signals will still continue through 2020. Okay. Uh, some of the smaller tracks, you know, may phase out next year. We don't know, but towards the end of 2020, when that's done, the majority of the signals in the tracks come out of Florida. So that'll have right. a big impact on, on the- uh, Revenue for those lines. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, can I go back just to one, um, the, the, uh, number 30, uh, the page 30, and I know there's, um, expenditures that are not reflected and we'll correct that. But in general, uh, are the commissions and, uh, and, and receipts uh, exceeding uh, the expenditures overall? They usually do. The last time we had a surplus was 2012. We had a hundred and, I wanna say $110,000 surplus, which was split yeah. between the, um, the, the purse, purse accounts with the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, from there until now, we have run into a deficit, but it's, it, last year was a $135,000 deficit. Okay. So it's really marginal, and it's always been pretty close to that. You know, a couple of years it's been under 100,000, a few over, but. Right, okay. That's great. It's a great report. Good work. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, again, thank you to the team. Uh, I know you just finished the season. And it's apparent every time we go out there how uh, every, everything is working smoothly. We are a model agency. And um, please thank the team for their professionalism and their hard work. Thank you. We have a great group working for us. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, thank you all. Okay, we'll move on now to the legal division. General Counsel Blue. Good morning, commissioners. We have two items for you today. The first is the non-disclosure agreement template and I have Deputy General Counsel Grossman here to speak to you on that. And then we have some amendments to the Gaming Equipment Regulation 205 CMR 146. So we'll start with the NDA template first. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good uh, afternoon. Oh, it's not quite afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I always get You're usually on late anyways. So I'm usually up at about noon, so right. I never figure out. Anyway. Um, 
As, as you're aware, we have uh, non-disclosure agreements that we uh, typically enter into with gaming licensees. Before you is the template that we use when negotiating these agreements. Uh, it, there was a particular issue identified in the template that uh, we thought the commission should have a look at in order to determine whether the right policy is reflected in this uh, non-disclosure template. And as you can see, it's highlighted in red on the next page um, of the, the packet. It's uh, paragraphs uh, 8 and 10. And it pertains to the commission's uh, obligation to notify the gaming licensees upon being contacted by a governmental agency uh, to provide certain information that is subject otherwise to uh, this agreement. Under the existing language, we would notify the licensee that we had been contacted by a governmental agency seeking information that is subject to the coverage of this agreement for purposes of allowing them to seek a protective order or some other type of court intervention, uh, perhaps preventing us from turning the information over. And there's a, there's a similar language relative to subpoenas. Under the uh, the new proposed language, that function would be made discretionary on the part of the commission if it were determined that the integrity of a governmental investigation could be compromised by notifying uh, the gaming licensee. Uh, it, it was included initially uh, as a means uh, to ensure that the licensees had a certain comfort level in providing us the wide variety of information that they do, some of which is required by law, other is uh, somewhat discretionary on their part. And as you'll recall, uh, absent the non-disclosure agreement, the Commission does not have any means to protect uh, from public disclosure much of the information that we do receive from the gaming licensees. So it is a, a, a critical component to our ability to, um, to fulfill our duties to oversee the uh, gaming uh, industry here in Massachusetts, to uh, take in as much information as possible and to be able to protect as much of it as possible. So that's, that's the issue that is before the commission. It's ultimately really just a matter of public policy at the moment. No, I just want to say thank you for um, working on the issue in terms of making sure that while we assure the licensees, we're also fulfilling our role as, you know, an investigative or enforcement body as well and working in conjunction with, um, you know, government investigations, et cetera, and not compromising anything unwittingly. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate taking, you taking the time to amend the template. My pleasure. So should it read that uh, shall not be under any obligation, et cetera, if it determines that the integrity is there an if there that needs to be right after the coma? And my question is more substantive than that. Is it the commission, us, or the agency uh, executive director or the legal department? How is that determination uh, and use of discretion is? Uh, the first question I think is easier. I think the if um, exists in the previous part of, of the sentence. Uh, yes. The second part is a little more complicated. Uh, typically, and this does not or has not yet come up with any frequency, uh, but we, the legal department typically processes all requests for public records, oftentimes in conjunction with other divisions of the commission, um, and makes a call as to whether the NDA applies or it doesn't apply. This would add a level of discretion uh, into the mix. And with many other things, I would say that if it were um, a, a significant uh, matter, I think we would probably bring it to the commission uh, to decide exactly what to do. But I think we would try to resolve it, if we could, um, at the staff level. Um, okay. My only concern with that is whether um erring in the side of protecting the integrity of an investigation is whether the judgment of general counsel's office is 
to disclose to the licensees, that would be something that prior to doing disclosure, um, I would hope the commission would be alerted. We as the commissioners would be alerted to something like that. That, I mean, obvious, that's, that's fair. Um, obviously bringing certain issues, we'd have to do that in executive, in executive session, session or come up with a way to do it, I guess. Um, yeah, we haven't really crossed that or confronted the issue, so it's hard to say, but I think your, your point is, is certainly uh, noted and um, we would make efforts, of course, to do that. We could, like in other areas, uh, use the expertise of one commissioner to have input on this. True. That may be appropriate, and I think Commissioner O'Brien would, uh, would be the appropriate commissioner to, to deal with these matters. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. I think it'll be rare, but if it does happen, um, I think that's, that, that would be an appropriate mm -hmm. way to move forward with mm -hmm. Commissioner O'Brien's uh, guidance in the matter, okay. or, or, or at least a, a notification yep. to yep. Commissioner O'Brien. So I, um, I take it the commission is comfortable with the proposed language which would modify the template moving forward yes. with any non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. And, this, um, and this issue requires a vote. Yes. Do we have a motion? Right. Commissioner, I move that the commission approve the template as presented today uh, to the commission um, subject also to the caveat that we discussed in terms of notification to me as a designated commissioner to the extent that the discretion is not exercised. I second that. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those not in favor? Zero. Passes for zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Second issue, the team is coming forward. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. So in your packet, you have some amendments to 205 CMR 146, which are the gaming equipment regulations. Uh, these changes were spurred by some issues related to um, just the comfort of the patrons at the physical tables. They were finding they were a bit overcrowded. And our regulations as they exist now are quite rigid and require a specific number of seats at each table. So we've just made some amendments to allow up to that number of seats so that if it does become overcrowded, the licensee can remove one of those chairs. Uh, we've also made um, some changes just to clean up the language to make sure it's clear what terms we're using when we're talking about the player's actual seat at the table versus the uh, bedding area on the table. So do you have any questions on those changes? Yeah, what happens when there's a chair removed uh, and, of course, the layout doesn't change? Is uh, there the layout will change with, with that. Oh, it will? Yeah, it will go down to, let's say, if it required seven originally, uh, and now they want to use six, their layout will, will have six on it. So this is something that, an adjustment that they don't necessarily do on, on the go? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not that hard to get a new uh, layout printed and, and things like that. And going okay. forward for, you know, patron comfort, they, they, a lot of places will reduce the number of seats yeah. available. Okay. I think I was missing the point that if it's overcrowded, you have less seats. Um, I think it's elbow room. How, oh, it's elbow how people, room? Yeah. You know, if it's yeah. too close, the tables are too close to each other, right? Oh, and see. there's They're enough. too close and crammed yeah. in. I see. Okay. Not able to, um, to be able to get yeah. in comfortably because of, you know. I understand now. Gives Thank the you. licensee discretion. I yeah. see. <laughs> Thank you. And previously, we were prescribing bedding positions. Yeah. Whatever the equipment Pretty much, you, if it said seven, you had to have seven you on had there. had to have seven. And seven people might not get along with each other when it have a little more space. Exactly. Okay. Further. No, Further questions? Very good. Very straightforward. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve uh, first the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 146 gaming equipment is included in the packet. Second. 
Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, those not in favor? 4 0. That passes. Uh, next, I move the Commission approve the amendments to 205 CMR 146 as included in the packet and authorize the staff to file the regulation on an emergency basis pursuant to Chapter 23K, Section 5B, and further to take the steps necessary to file the regulation with the Secretary of the Commonwealth and to proceed with a formal regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Not in favor? 4 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we will move on to um, community mitigation. Mr. Delaney will be assisting us. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm um, pinch hitting for John today. Um, but before we start, um, we'd like to uh, thank all of the members of the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, the Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committees, and the Subcommittee on Community Mitigation for their uh, participation and input into this process. Um, and in particular, we would uh, like to mention the Region A Chair, Richard Caraviello, representing the City of Medford. Uh, the Region B Chair, Jill McCarthy Payne, representing the City of Springfield and Ron Hogan from Region A and Carmina Fernandez from Region B who are our subcommittee members. Um, back on October 25th, we had a fairly lengthy discussion here on the draft guidelines, so um, I won't go into a whole lot of depth on a lot of them. I'll just touch on some of the high points and on some of the things we may not have discussed uh, in depth on that day. Uh, for our 2019 spending targets, we spent a little bit of time on this, this issue. Um, what we're recommending is uh, a $200,000 spending target for the Category 2 facility with $2.5 million for Region A and uh, $4 million for Region B, that being the, the $2.5 million from the original uh, gaming licenses plus the $1.5 million that they expect to generate between August and, and September makes up that difference between Region A and Region B. What was the spending target? Remind me of the uh, category two. 200,000. 200, That's basically been our historic our spending historical. on that. And obviously, we can modify that a little bit if, if we, for some reason, received lots of applications for that area, we can reevaluate mm. that, that split. Um, one of the things we talked about was um, having regional target spending, which we just went over, um, and it was agreed that the money that was generated in Region A would stay in Region A, money in Region B would stay in Region B, with the Category 2 being a, a combination from both of the, the facilities, since they don't generate any uh, community mitigation funds themselves. Um, now, what we also did in this, we were saying that any uh, money that would carry over that it was generated, we carried it over for a period of up to three years, and our, uh, our guidelines reflect that. Uh, when we were in all the committee meetings, there was some talk about having the carryover money being first in, first out. Um, and we looked at that, and, and that kind of a more open-ended system um, could benefit a region by allowing funds to accumulate for a potential large project but also um, that accumulation could also be at the expense of some of the more immediate needs of other regions. Um, so we are uh, proposing you know, what we did in the guidelines and that's what we're recommending to move forward with. The three year carryover? Yeah, three years and at the end of three it goes back to a, the gen yeah. sort of what we call a general fund that can go to either region. Right. Um, rather than having this first in first out means that any carryover is the first dollar spent if that region continues to um, uh, expend less than what they're allocated, what you wind up with is all of the old money being spent first and sort of larger uh, potential surpluses being generated in that area, mm -hmm. which then the commission, at some point, the commission would have to come back and say, well, do we want to continue to sort of hold this money or move it? Yep. This gives a, a little bit more uh, definitive guidelines on when that money comes back. Mm -hmm. to the general uh, fund to be 
split between the regions right. as necessary. But it's only that first year money that comes back after three years, right? right. Not the, right. the if, second year comes back. For the sake back. of argument, if we said that uh, the first year there was a, a million dollar carried over and then next year it was two million, that first million plus another million, and so on. After the third year, that first million would roll back, but that second and third, it would be a, whole, a rolling. A rolling. Um, uh, revision, I guess, uh, reversion to the, to the uh, and hey, it could still come back to that region, frankly. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. It Absolutely. just comes back to the to the. And look, we hope that it never comes to this. Yeah. We hope that if someone right. underexpends one year, that they make up with that with additional expenditures the next year. But we're just trying yeah. to do this sort of a, as a just in case um, right. uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we were asked to look at was. Um, the potential for additional applications to be submitted post February 1. Um, so there are two pieces to this. The first piece is that um, our, uh, by statute, we're required to have a February 1st deadline. Mm -hmm. So we don't think that without a legislative change that we can have sort of a general kind of rolling admission process. Um, the second part of it is that we said that previously we had set up um, uh, reserves for the individual cities and towns. What we could do is set up a reserve that would have to be applied for by some entity, which we don't know who that would be yet, um, that could sort of reserve that money for potential emergency expenditures. Now, right now, we have no language in our guidelines that allows that. So if, um, if the commission wants to move ahead with that and any motion you would have to give us the authority to essentially write some guidelines around that and to make that happen. So right now we've said it's it's a possibility but we don't have anything written really to make that happen. I think just to, to, to add on to what Joe uh, discussed, we kind of had this question here really kind of percolated it up to the community mitigation subcommittee which is what do we do in this window from February 1st to the following February 1st. If there's an emergency mitigation that needs to happen, we can't, I don't think we should be in a position of just saying, well, you'll have to wait until the next deadline. We want to, I think, try to be more proactive and address something. Um, keeping in mind, there are certainly uh, language and host community and surrounding community agreements to potentially deal with some of these issues. Um, but. My thought in, in talking with, with John and Joe was to say, we know that there's going to be some extra money available from what MGM is contributing to the pot, even though there's obviously this uh, focus on keeping the money locally, but um, creating kind of an emergency reserve that a host community I guess in this case could apply for it would still require commission approval as we did with the with the previous reserve process that John and Joe and um, Mary created uh, and that we created in past years and again to set this money aside if an emergency comes up that we need to deal with um, we just don't want again I don't think we want to find ourselves in a position of saying we got to put you off until the next mitigation round but what could come up that's an emergency that needs something that it cannot could be wait? unforeseen so I can't really right. say <laughs> well what I, has there been anything or something possibly right yeah. related to the casino if it if the casino functioning somehow was affected you know their continued functioning based on some sort of damage yeah. or that impacts the community yeah, I in 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 I not to to interject. I think we were wrestling with this question, and I would suggest you know putting it forward as kind of a, a one year pilot. Let's see how it happens. You know, see what might come up, see what may not come up, but at the same time, um, you know, still giving us as a commission the ultimate authority to approve an emergency kind of reserve application. It's not just there and the community can come get it when they want to, which was the old reserve process that, but we still have some authority. You know, we're, we're kind of walking into some unchartered waters that um, is, is our, I think our interest is heightened by the fact that we've always had this February 1st deadline statute provided for it, but should we just be 
a little more cautious and think of what might happen between these yeah. funding rounds. I, I, I just don't see it. I, I, I think, if anything, we could try to um, allow for some retroactivity um, if it fits within the guidelines uh, and keep to the, to the, you know, to the uh, statutory deadline. Um, I think in the past, the only thing that came up was somebody who missed the deadline. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, if it's something that we've done in the past, they could appropriate, they, the, the communities could react accordingly, appropriate the money, tap their own uh, funding reserves um, for uh, emergencies and whatnot, and then come back to the commission at any time um, you know, for some retroactive um, consideration. Uh, I think creating this reserve um, for emergencies might just just sounds like um, I don't know stretching the guideline the the statutory dateline uh, in the, and opening the door for a lot of I don't know requests that might be hard to manage. Um, I'd like to hear from General Counsel Blue with regard to the statutorily uh, the deadline and what what our um, ability is. So the February 1st deadline applies to the commission and applications have to be in by February 1st. We would have to do some careful thinking about how to set this up because when we did the reserves to the communities, the commission made an award to the community as based on a February 1st application. When it came back, the commission really wasn't approving the award per se, they were approving a use. They, they gave the money, they gave it to the community subject to them coming back and telling us about it. In a, in a situation like this, there would have to be an application by February 1st by some entity to put this reserve into their hands. We would have to think about what kinds of guidelines we wanted to craft around that so that the entity with the reserve money could make a decision that complied with our guidelines. So we can go back and craft something for the commission to look at but the February 1st application date really, as far as the commission is concerned, is a pretty hard and fast kind of date. So I, I appreciate the idea of a reimbursement, and that is something we should consider too. But this is a little different than the reserves we set up for individual communities. Yeah, I just, I just don't see, and again, it's on, it's, it would be for an unforeseen condition, so I don't, uh, you know, but um, I don't, I don't, it's hard for me to imagine the emergency that would warrant this, uh, if, especially we have now an ongoing process. We have this year over year. Uh, in some cases, communities are not really spending the money that they have uh, been uh, awarded, uh, which creates you know enough of a cash flow in the fund, um, you know, to again monitor and manage and whatnot and make awards the following year. Um, I think within that context, you know communities at any time, and they have in the past, can come in and say, in, you know, can I modify my prior award, I don't know, split it for the next fiscal year, or whatever whatever the case may be, um, and, again, and, and give us the discretion at that time to make any adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the, 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 the funding round and the award round, I think it's important to preserve. Otherwise, it becomes too hard to manage. Yeah, I, it, again, and it, I, I was thinking of a motion that would certainly allow our ombudsman and, and Joe to work with legal to kind of lay out this framework and, and, and make an application available by February 1st. Um, and just thinking initially about the idea of giving a community a chance to come back to us and having them expend the funds um, would put us in a position of having to accept that community's definite, we spent this money, we thought it was an emergency, that would put us in a position of two choices. We don't think it's an emergency, so you had to go and spend your own money, as opposed to a position where maybe we're communicating a little bit more with the community to try to come together and figure out if something was an emergency purpose. Um, as opposed to maybe finding ourselves in a position where we've stuck the community with the bill and we said, we're not going to reimburse you. So, I, I, I mean, again, it's, it's, I think it's something we all agreed we w wish we had thought through a little bit more and vetted a little bit more and got some more feedback from, but um, 
uh, but coming up in that last subcommittee meeting, again, I'm just, I'm worried about us not being able to respond to, again, an unforeseen emergency and this, you know, we adopt guidelines every year, so this may not be a guideline next year, but uh, I'd like to think that we could test it out for one year and, and I see actually where we think might that changing it. guidelines on communities from year to year creates more of an uncertainty, frankly. But uh, I just, the, the certainty of the funding round deadline and what these monies are for with, you know, with the, with the funding round review, um, I think should be, should be enough. I just cannot, cannot fathom the need for, for an emergency that cannot be, you know, addressed in, in any other, in, in other ways in which communities currently do, um, you know, that would be related to this fund. I think for me, the preliminary base open question is really talking to, with the general counsel's group in terms of is there a way, given the statutory structure, to set up a fund either that resides with the commission, that can be applied for at any point by um, the community, or would it have to be the community who applies by the February 1 and then comes back and, and it, maybe neither one is possible under the current structure? It, it cannot reside with the commission with an application that comes in after February 1st. The money would have to be given to maybe to an organization. If the commission wanted to have a sort of emergency reserve for each community as you did reserves before, that would be one way to do that. But I think if you're thinking this is a, a fund that would cover emergencies across the Commonwealth based on an impact from a casino, there would have to be some other organization that applied by February 1st, and the commission would have to award that money to that organization. Then the next step would be how would the commission monitor that organization giving out the funds? And it, there would need to be guidelines that that organization had to follow. And so we could come back potentially for some sort of review. But the February 1st application date kind of, it, it makes it a little bit difficult for us to have something that arises as an emergency after February 1st. I, I just don't see the emergency um, for, for something like this. I, I, know, I know it's, you know, it's hard to say that uh, we would, ne we would never would close the door to something like this. What if, what if there's a real emergency? Well, we'll, we'll let's, let's see it happen and you know, schedule it for the next commission meeting and, 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 and think about it. Um, I think designing a program uh, like this that um, has its merits, if, it's, um, if people know that there's a, a funding round that's statutory and that there's guidelines that come out every year and there's going to be a review process uh, for any one of these um, um, requests for consideration. And there's even some flexibility embedded in our whole uh, process in which prior awards can be rethought, reconsidered flex with, with, some, with, a, with some flexibility. Um, it, is, it is really hard for me to imagine that there would be an event that's of such magnitude that that uh, and, and the, the mitigation, the community mitigation uh, money is the only source uh, that could address that for us to do something like this. Uh, that's that's really only somebody can give me a concrete example uh, where you know these things wouldn't apply. I, it's hard for me to go along with this suggestion. Well, it doesn't sound like it's feasible legally. Is what you're saying? It's. It would be difficult legally. I mean, we would we would work to try to craft something that we would present to you for you to consider, but it is it is difficult when you're trying to balance the application deadline versus the commission's ultimate control over how the funds are handed out. Well, I think um, we need a vote on this item today, but Commissioner Stebbins, maybe some more work for next year would be appropriate, but uh, working with the legal team. But it doesn't sound like we're at a point where we're, we, we can move forward um, unless you, you, you have more to, to give us here. Yeah, I, 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 I would share with you, and I'm not officially putting this in the form of the motion, but the motion I was going to offer would uh, allow us to authorize the ombudsman, the con 
construction project oversight manager working with our legal department to adopt a framework and apply and provide an application for an emergency reserve of $250,000 for the host community to apply for by February 1st. So giving you a sense of, again, not an official motion, but to give you a sense of where we could go with this. I'm just not hearing enough from legal that this is that this is feasible. That's where I'm. I, I think I am not going to assume that I know that an emergency will not happen. But I'm, I'm more concerned with what we can do legally here. So I think what you've proposed, Commissioner Stebbins, can be done in the current structure. If a host community were to come to us and say, "I want to create an emergency fund." If something comes up during the year, then we would review that through the Community Mitigation Fund in the normal course. What it, what it would require is that every community that wanted to do that would need to make an application for that, which is also fine, too. I don't, I don't think you need a separate program. We would probably need some guidelines to put into this document about what constitutes an emergency. But you would not need to change the process, I don't think, if you're going to have them apply for that kind of a fund by February 1st. Yeah, I'd, I'd much rather get that. Uh, if, if people say there's been a number of things that have come up in the past that we've had to fund because the deadline has always passed, uh, we feel that you know we didn't even bring it up to you guys. What, uh, what about the next year? Um, you know, could you could you do that? That would be fine. It's it's the concept of creating a, an emergency reserve that I have um, a problem with. Is it the emergency reserve that resides with the host community or the, the creation of an emergency fund? The latter. Out? The latter. Because I think that opens the door for a, num for a number of things that become very hard to manage. There's enough <coughs> for us to do that uh, the, the team does, uh, you know, year round, including not um, in a small way, all of these consultations uh, with the local community mitigation advisory committees and whatnot, and disseminating the information and appraising them of what's new and what remains, um, that people should be generally in a good position to know what's coming. Um, there is also a finite, you know, a, a, a small number of, of uh, communities really that we see from um, from year to year. Um, you know, of course, given the proximity and the, you know the host and surrounding communities, and there's plenty of, in my view, um, different sources to tap into from uh, for 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 things that do come up. Um, so, are we comfortable moving forward with um, with the idea that within our existing regulations framework. and framework we can um, there may be a, a possibility of moving forward with your concerns Commissioner? yeah I again I'm not I'm, I'm not sure within the frameworks we have proposed for this year we could you know address kind of an emergency or critical situation again and I, I, I hear your point it's trying to think through what that could possibly be well let him uh, tell us is is I understand that our point is we can't really help them out potentially for another year, which is not where I want to find ourselves or I would hope we could be a little more responsive. But, but that has never come up. It, it, I understand. I understand. But we now have one class one casino that is open and operating um, and potentially another one uh, uh, to begin operations within this current or upcoming calendar year. But. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I've raised my point. I'm happy to set it aside and, and, and see if we can do some uh, more vetting and investigation and probably give our local community mitigation advisory uh, groups a chance to weigh in on this kind of notion as we go forward. I, th I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, just one, one more item to discuss um, that we didn't get to talk about too much back on October 25th, um, all of our grant programs, we're proposing uh, all of them to be the same as last year, 
with the same amount of, of money uh, as you know for maximum applications. With the exception of uh, one item, we have added what we're calling a, a transit project of regional significance. And we're proposing to put uh, $500,000 towards that on a statewide basis. And what this would allow is, um, uh, well, I, a little background. The genesis of this whole thing was uh, the pedestrian bridge in Everett and the ability of the commission to potentially provide some uh, funds towards that, primarily towards the head house connector and that kind of thing. And um, the, the idea behind this is that the, the commission would be able to put some money towards that as long as there are, you know, it's a generally a small amount of money compared to the money that's being put up by either private entities, federal, state, or other uh, sources of funds. And uh, as we, uh, started looking at this, we realized that this is not just for this particular project, but this is for, uh, you know, down in the Category 2 uh, area. There's been some talk of a, a regional connector between Plain Ridge and Foxborough and Rentham and Great Woods and other, other locations down there. Out in the western region, um, there's been uh, some talk of potentially trying to increase uh, service by PVTA for late night service and other things to help service the casino employees better. You know, nothing been firmly uh, defined at this point, but um, the idea is that we will put a, a sort of a small amount of money towards that this year uh, because really any kind of a project like this isn't going to really get off the ground for a little while and that there would probably only be a very small amount of expenditures within this next fiscal year on any one of those projects. Um, so that's essentially what, what we're proposing on that. And with that, um, I guess we'd take any uh, other questions that you may have. And, um, uh, you know, we look for a motion um, uh, on the guidelines, um, giving us some authority to make some minor changes consistent with the guidelines, and then uh, what you uh, want to do with the uh, regional reserve or the emergency reserve. Um, We'll take whatever we have on that, and we expect that we'll uh, post the applications, assuming you approve it, early next week. Uh, again, I, I give a, a great shout out to, to John and, and Joe and Mary for, and Jill um, for the great work that they do uh, meeting with the local community mitigation advisory committees, uh, the community mitigation subcommittee to kind of pull all this feedback together. Um, uh, as long as meet, we meet quorum, um, we have good meetings. Um, but I uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the work that's gone into this. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the 2019 Community Mitigation Fund uh, guidelines as uh, provided in the packet, subject to any kind of grammatical changes or immaterial changes. Um, Second. Discussion? Um, so this doesn't include the notion of the emergency piece at this point? No, it's not included it's not in the guidelines, so we can Fair enough. review and consider that for another day. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Not in favor? Hearing none, the motion passes 4-0. Next, we're on to Thank commissioners' updates. Do, do we have any for today? No. Okay, the next uh, item, item nine, is an executive session. And uh, the commission will now go into uh, an executive session pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, for the purpose of discussing litigation strategy in the case of Stephen A. Wynn versus Karen Wells, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, Win resorts uh, when a discussion in an open session would have a detrimental effect on litigation um, position for the commission. The commission will not reconvene in open session at the end of the executive session. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Second. Okay. Hearing second, uh, uh, is there any further discussion on that? Um, I'd like to take uh, a roll call vote of the commission to go into executive session. Commission Stebbins? Yes. Uh, Commissioner uh, Zuniga? Yes. Commissioner O'Brien? Yes. 
And I vote in the affirmative as well. Um, thank you. The Commission is now in executive session. Pursuant to the open meeting law, all members of the public and any staff members not involved in this matter to be discussed must leave the room. I ask that all live um, audio and video recording and live streaming be shut off and the doors to the room be closed. Thank you.